Okay. All right, so welcome to MathStat 341. This is going to be lecture seven. And what I want to do today is continue what we were doing in spirit yesterday, is talking about how do you attack a problem? And so the problem I want to talk about today is some work in progress with a professor of statistics from the Boston area. Uh, we've known each other for you know, so many years, it would take me a while just to figure out just exactly how long our families have known and visited each other. And one of the big lessons from today is that you often have a lot of freedom in terms of what you study and trying to find what is the right metric. Is there anybody here who has taken a philosophy class? Okay. So depending on what you want to choose as your axioms, you know, you can prove almost anything in a philosophy class. And then the dispute is, of course, whether or not you start with a reasonable set of axioms. If you want to prove God exists, well, depending on what you start with, it's going to be either very easy or very convoluted. And so when we're analyzing questions, if we have the freedom to choose the statistic, we might choose something different than someone else, and we might end up with a different conclusion. And then the question is, who's right? And a lot of times there is no you know, clear answer as to who's right and who's wrong. It's given these metrics, given these conditions, this is the natural correct answer to get. All right. So this was a talk that we gave at the MathFest conference, which is a you know, wonderful gathering. Uh, sadly, it was virtual like many things this year, although we are beginning to resume online uh, meetings. Can anybody tell me in sports what a goat is? Greatest of all time. So we wanted to find the goat of goats. All right, who is the greatest? So in each sport, you could ask who is the greatest. But what happens when you go from sport to sport? This is an extremely broad question right now. And as such, we can't really answer it. So we have to narrow it down a little bit. So anybody want to help me narrow down the universe of discussion for this? Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, one, one fifth would not be necessarily is the greatest in one sport. It's not necessarily the greatest in one sport. And then also, depending on what position somebody is playing, it's but it might be hard. Right, so it could be extremely hard. I mean, even if you stick within one sport, it could be hard to compare, you know, a pitcher versus a, you know, hitter. So you could do things like career win percentage, but how much of this is going to matter is going to depend on who else is on your team, who your coaches are. Yes. You could try something like wins above like the average player. Good, so you could try to find statistics in wins above replacement, which is a great statistic in baseball that tries to look at how much are you contributing above a normal person. Now, different sports, you might actually have a greater chance to have a larger wins above replacement. There is a very natural question, however, that no one has hit me on. So one is the year you're competing. There were many years when Babe Ruth had more home runs as an individual than every team in baseball but one. Which team do you think he didn't beat? The Yankees, his own. Now, CC Sabathia a few years ago led both the American League and the National League in shutouts in the same year. You know, he was traded mid-season. Truly phenomenal to lead both leagues in a category like that. But when you compare people across different eras, uh, you know, one of the things you have to take into account is uh, you had very different pools of players available in the early years of many sports. And so you don't have the same level of competition. So in a lot of things, if you don't have a strong two or three, you could look far, far better by comparison. But there's still a really obvious question. Yes. So one is, but again, that could be partly a function of do you have a good agent? And it could also be a function of what are the salary freedoms in the league? You know, are you allowed to negotiate? For a lot of players, they are trapped in very small contracts. Well, for them, very small. For us, it's like, oh my God. But there's a big question. Number of championships. Okay, one is number of championships. But this is just so blind as on. That no one has even asked this question yet. Yes. Uh, news coverage. One is the amount of news coverage. But we're trying to figure out who is the goat of goats in sports. 
So what do we need to now our conversation to? Yes. What is a sport? What is a sport? Pawn to queen, bishop four. You know, great move in Star Trek three-dimensional chess. You know, do we consider something like chess a sport? And we actually had a wonderful discussion at this conference as to exactly what is a sport. I want to see some kind of direct competition between people. And then it becomes interesting. Do you consider something like gymnastics or skating a sport where you can adjust your program in some of them based on the scores people had before you? Or if you're doing cycling, you know, depending on how people are in front of you in terms of breaking things. So huge discussion as to what do we even want to consider as a sport? Then the next thing is, do we want to allow things like tennis or golf? Yes, golf, no. Tennis, yes, golf, no. Why not golf? Oh, For no reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you have to have a little bit stronger hand motion when you say, come on. Yeah, I, I mean, golf depends on physical prowess slash skill better than you know, physical. So I, I do think that now they're very different. Yeah, I just enjoy hitting golf. There's nothing. No, there's, there's nothing. <laughs> Hey, when, when you slap the buzzer for the time, you yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so, you know, the question is, does it have to be a physical sport? Now, if it's an individual sport like tennis or golf, it's a lot easier to compare uh, people. And so let's focus today on team sports. And so as a uncultured American, what do I mean by a team sport? Football, Football basketball, basketball, baseball, baseball hockey. maybe hockey, <laughs> right? Definitely not soccer. Definitely soccer. Not soccer. So soccer is not considered a sport. <laughs> All right. Um, is basketball what? Uh, yes, you have a bunch of plays and then you have the officials. And the officials in basketball are really another player in terms of just how much is called. Uh, this is one of the things I like most about baseball. The biggest impact of the officiating is the balls and strikes. And now you have the fascinating possibility of even that being eliminated because of the robotic pitch. Uh, ro the, the robots that are now going to potentially be calling balls and strikes. They've started doing this in the minors. But in you know, football and basketball, you often have you know, egregious calls by the officials, especially you know, late in the game, that really impact what's going on. And again, right now, I really don't care what the answer is. What I care about is the thought process to get there. And this is ongoing work. So if anybody is interested, my colleague and I are writing a series of papers on this. And it is definitely avenues for you know, student involvement. If you want this to be part of your grade for the course, happy to have this count as you know, the project. And this will give you a chance to do some mathematical statistical writing. This will give you a chance to get you know, something published. When you are applying for jobs, it's nice to have something that you can point to. I've had a bunch of students who have done projects like this and has helped you know, them in you know, getting jobs at you know, major league franchises. I've had students work with me on lawsuits, which lead to interesting conversations where they can mention that they worked on lawsuits, but they can't describe anything that they did in the job interview, which they said is a lot of fun. All right, so we want to try to figure out who is the goat of goats across sports. And we know that this is not a well-posed question. I'm sorry? So we will we will come back to the one, you know if we include hockey and you know, is Gretzky you know a acceptable answer? I think if you look at hockey, Gretzky is clearly the goat of hockey. But the question is, how do you compare Gretzky and hockey versus other people? Uh, before we go any further, anybody let, let's throw out some contenders. And again, a lot of this is going to be a function of how old are you. But I am glad that people at least know who Gretzky is. Who else would you throw as a contender for the goat of goats? Yes. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. How many people have seen the original Space Jam movie? Uh, my son was extremely young when he saw it, maybe like three years old. And he viewed the movie very differently than I think anyone else in the world. When it was over, he looked at me and goes, Daddy, yes. Do you think Michael Jordan will ever play baseball again? <laughs> so you know, my son and I are baseball people, we're not basketball people. So you have Michael Jordan, and I'm assuming you mean Michael Jordan for basketball. Just being clear, because he is one he is one of the few people who actually played in both. Uh, Danny Ainge, I think, did better um, on average in the two sports than Michael Jordan, because Danny Ainge actually played, I believe, for the Toronto Blue Jays. Bo Jackson, Bo Jackson is another one. 
All right, so we have Michael Jordan. We have Wayne Gretzky. Anyone else? LeBron. LeBron. All right, we put in LeBron. Anyone else? Tom Brady. Yeah, who else? I'm sorry? Mike Tyson. So that's interesting. Um, if we're doing team sports, we have to eliminate Mike Tyson. But um, you know, boxing is a you know really interesting one to look at records and whatnot. Other ones. And again, you may be too young for some of these. Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice. Uh, Jerry Rice would be a good candidate. Now, what's nice about Rice is he thrived with two different NFL quarterbacks, Montana and Young. And so you always want to get a sense of how much is due to the person, how much is due to the supporting cast. There's at least one more natural person that you're all probably too young to know. I am too young to know as well, but you know, growing up in Boston, you know, there are certain things that you just have to learn. Uh, no, I mean, Ted Williams is fascinating. You know, he played on a team that never really did that well, but he also lost the prime of his career twice, serving in World War II and serving in Korea. But I'm thinking of a basketball player for the Celtics, Bill Russell. Bill Russell. All right, so we'll look at Bill Russell in great detail as to does he deserve to be the goat of goats. All right, so again, this is just your preliminary. We're trying to show that metrics matter. Depending on your choice, you can get different answers. So now, if you want to be, say, biased, what you can do is you can start with the answer you want and work backwards. You know, what statistics do I need if I want this to be my answer? And then you can come up with, here's a plausible set of statistics to look at. You know, there's many different ones. These are the ones we chose. And you can easily pass something like that off. The more honest approach is to really think before you do any analysis as to what statistics truly matter. And again, there's no right or wrong answer, but there are some answers that I think are more believable than others. Uh, for baseball, we've mentioned Babe Ruth. I would put Ruth in the conversation as well. So here's one of my uh, favorite images. I don't know how well you can see this. Have I mentioned this image yet in class? Okay, so this is the one where, depending on which website you looked at on June 4th, 2018, either the Red Sox or the Yankees were listed as being in first. And what I love is in this website, the Red Sox are in first, the Yankees are in second with a higher winning percentage in one game back. And on this website, the Yankees are in first, one game behind the Red Sox who are listed in second. And it comes down to how you calculate things. Do you do it by winning percentage or games back? Now, at the end of the season, it doesn't really matter because every team will have played the same number of games. But at this point in the season, the Yankees had played six fewer games. One of the Yankee games had actually been suspended and they were in the middle of it and they finished playing it in August. And when they finally finished playing it in August, the Yankees lost. And so I can't print out a better copy by going online because they've now changed the standings online to reflect the conclusion of that game. So if you go back and you search on the archives from 2018, they've actually adjusted it. So the Yankees have one more loss at this point. How, how is games behind calculated? So basically every win is plus a half, every loss is minus a half. So the Sox played six more games going four and two which is a 666 percentage, which lowers the win percentage. They get a plus two from the winning, uh, a minus one from the losing, and so they end up as a plus one. So what you would have to do is you would actually have to find physical newspapers to actually get what this was. This is really 1984. And as I remarked in class, because the game was continued in August, but started in May, all the statistics for the game count as a May statistic. And one of the players for the Astros is now recorded as having his first home run in the majors five days before he was called up, which was truly impressive. So this is a trivial example of how the choice of statistics matters. In the end, it's not gonna be a big deal because at the end of the season, this you know, washes away. I'm not gonna go into details in cross country. Anybody here a runner? All right, so depending on how you score meets, you could have a very interesting cycle of in one scoring, um, you know, A beats B, but B beats C. I'm sorry, A beats B, B beats C, but C beats A. And you can have lots of interesting issues like this. Um, if you do voting theory, you can have similar things like this as well, depending on how 
you do voting, you could have candidate A, B, 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 C, and C, B, A. All right. So, you know, as I remarked, you know, which comes first, you know, the metric or the GOAT? We will be honest in this class and we will really think about the metric we want and then do the analysis and not choose, you know, who we want. You know, even if we have, you know, preferences as to who we think should be the GOAT of GOATs, we will not let that, uh, that we will not let that influence our choice of metric. All right. So here were the ones we came up with for football. I don't think you can come up with anybody other than Tom Brady. So if anybody wants to try to make an argument for someone other than Tom Brady, I'm quite happy to listen. I'm on board with Jerry Rice. Okay, why Jerry Rice over Tom Brady? I don't like Tom Brady. <laughs> okay, so one of my favorite Seinfeld episodes is he's returning a shirt to a store and they asked him, you know, why are you returning it? He goes, for spite. And he goes, we can't let you return something for spite. Oh, okay, I don't like it. Well, I'm sorry, once you said you're returning it for spite, that's your excuse and we're not letting you change. So you are absolutely welcome to have wrong beliefs such as, you know, Weiss over Brady. You know, that's absolutely fine, that's protected. But you can't say because I don't like Tom Brady. So you have to give me a better reason than you don't like Tom Brady. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, yeah. um, where were you having this argument? No, no, no. At, at least go free. <laughs> better staff. Well, well, here's here's the best argument for uh, Peyton Manning over uh, Brady, and I'll, I'll give you a good argument. No, I mean, hey, no, but but no, but but he, 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 here's the argument for Peyton Manning, uh, quarterback for the you know Colts and then the Broncos over Tom Brady for the. Patriots and now the uh, Tampa Bay. My first year at Williams as a professor, you know, we move out and we go to watch the opening you know, Patriots game against Kansas City. And we put on the TV and we try to find the game and we get Bill's Jets. We go, Bill's Jets? Oh crap, our TV's out of Albany. We're getting the Jets. And so we're seeing the updates on the Patriots game on the bottom of the screen. It's like, geez, the game's been paused at like 12 minutes, 30 something seconds for quite a long time. Somebody's probably injured. I wonder, oh God, I hope it's not Brady. And so Brady was injured. And who did the Patriots bring in as their quarterback for the rest of the season? That's how memorable this person is. Matt Castles, who never started a, who never started a game in college. He was a backup quarterback in college at USC. He last started in high school. The Patriots went 11 and five that season and only missed the playoffs on a third or fourth round tie break. Whereas when Manning went down, the Colts essentially lost like their first 12 games. So when you're trying to see how good is a player, one possibility is to look at, well, what do they do without that player? What is the infrastructure? And this is why a lot of people were fascinated about what would happen when Brady leaves the Patriots, is how much is due to Belichick, how much is due to the philosophy, you know, next man up. You know, if someone goes down, someone steps up and you fill in the gap. The Patriots went 11 and five the year Brady went down. You know, the Colts were disastrous. Now when Manning won his Super Bowl with the Broncos, I think the most generous description of his performance is, mediocre, I would say adequate. I don't think I would say pretty good, for his statistics against, you know, when he was playing as a Bronco in the Super Bowl, he, he did well enough to win. It was the Broncos defense that year that really won the game. So I, I think you could try to make an argument on an individual level of Manning over Brady. And this is why it gets so hard is how do you compare players across teams? If you have no defense, that means you often start with the ball deep in your own territory and that limits the plays you can do. If you have no receivers, you don't have anybody to throw the game to. If you don't have a credible running back, then they know you have to pass. And so it's really hard to answer any questions like this. This is why wrestling, boxing, tennis, even golf, you know, they're much better because it's a one-on-one -on -one game. And when you're trying to do a team game like this and figure out who's the greatest of all time, how the hell do you do this? So out of curiosity, um, these will be the candidates, Brady, Russell. Uh, Russell played 13 years with the Celtics. They made it to the finals 12 times and won 11 of them. So no one has 
that good of a record. Babe Ruth, you know, not as many titles, but just when you look at his dominance to everyone else, and the fact that he was dominant, not just as a hitter, but also as a pitcher. And then other is anybody else in any other sport, any other team sport. So how many people will vote for Brady? And I guess I will not vote, so people don't see. So we have one, two votes, two votes for Brady. All right, Russell. Okay, Ruth. Other. All right, so other wins three to two with a lot of abstentions. No, and again, you know, there are times when you, we don't have necessarily enough to vote. Um, hopefully we can compare Jordan and Russell, that we can at least answer the question of who's better. And again, you have to decide what are you going to do about those two years that Jordan left? Uh, when you're putting in LeBron into the mix, how much credit, how many teams has LeBron won a championship with? Is it three? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's three, right? Yep. So he's done it three times with three teams. I'm sorry, he, he's done it more than three times. He's done it with three different teams. That's impressive to go to three different organizations. And you want to look at. Okay, I, I wasn't sure if he had three or four championships. I know he's done it with. I thought he did it twice with Miami. He won. I thought he won twice with the Heat. Right. And so I'm, I'm being safe by saying he's done it with three different teams. And the question is, how good were the teams before he came there? You know, in basketball, when you look percentage-wise as to how much of the team you make up when you move, that's huge. And so to try to get a sense of just, you know, the value somebody adds, that's a really good metric to use. All right, so let's follow up with data. So extra credit, cultural extra credit, if anyone can tell me who this is a picture of, from what movie. All right, so instead of looking at the GOAT, and the hint is the word boat, we're gonna look for the best of all teammates. Yes? Like I keep feeling I know I recognize it. <laughs> okay, nope. Okay, so the question we decided to analyze was the best of all teammates is that we thought that that was a much easier question to analyze than the greatest of all time. And so just who is helping the team the most? And again, there are many different ways to help your team. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I'm still able to manage my sons or help coach my son's baseball team. You don't always put your best player in each position at that position. You look at where's the team going to be strongest. And it might be better to move you to another place because we have somebody who can play that position passively but you would be much better than the other person there. Who helps the team win the most? And so preliminary research showed that Brady and Russell were really good candidates to start looking at. You know, Jordan, um, LeBron, these would absolutely have to be added to any you know, serious conversation without a doubt. And so let's make some very simple assumptions and see what they give us. And so this is a way to now introduce some of the concepts and distributions we're gonna be looking at later in the year. So the first is essentially the coin flip model. You know, we assume that everybody is equal. All teams have the same chance each year of making the playoffs. Do you think this is a reasonable assumption? No, why not? Some teams are better, but over time, is each team going to have the same chance? No, why not? Yeah, I mean, if you're a really good team, you're more likely to try to, you're more likely to attract good players. And so you could have this vicious cycle of teams constantly rebuilding. So what do sports do to try to prevent this? Salary cap, Salary cap. what else? Draft picks, easier schedules. So in football, the better you do in a year, the harder schedule you're allegedly supposed to have the next year. So there are some things you can do to try to balance things out a little bit. But there's going to be a huge tendency for bad teams to stay bad and good teams to stay good. You know, especially if people play for a couple of years. Let's just do a simple analysis. So we're going to assume each team has the same chance of making the playoffs. And so in Brady, he made the playoffs 18 out of 20 years. Uh, there was one point in time when somebody hacked, or not hacked, I guess, adjusted the Wikipedia page for the AFC conference championship game. 
and they changed it to the AFC Conference Championship is an annual event where one team in the AFC has the opportunity to play the New England Patriots for the right to advance to the Super Bowl. And this was after the Patriots had just made it some like eight straight years, it was incredible. So in 20 years, Brady made it 18 times in a 32 team league with 12 making the uh, playoffs. So you would say your probability of making the playoffs is 12 over 20. And you wanna calculate what is the probability you make it at least 18 times in 20 years. So you have to do either 18, 19, or 20. So if P, the probability of making it is 12 over 20, the probability of not making it is eight over 20. And so we're just flipping a coin, a biased coin. And so to get 18 heads, how would you calculate that? What's the probability that you make it exactly 18 times? Yes. Good, good. Yes. So it's 20 choose 18. We choose 18 of the spots to be heads. Then it's 12 20ths to the 18. Then it's 8 20ths to the 8. And then we do similarly the calculation for 19 and 20. And we add them up together. And you get an extremely small percentage. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, 12 30 seconds. Sorry. Sorry, it should be 12 30 seconds. Um, I, I, I was looking at the 20 years and I was getting that number. You're right, it's absolutely right. It's, it's 32. So it's 12 30 seconds. And then the probability of not making it would then be 20 30 seconds. And then if you look at Bill Russell making it uh, 13 times out of 13, that looks very impressive. But he was in a smaller league. And so in that league, there were more than half of the teams that were making the playoffs. And so when you do a similar calculation, it's a small number, but it's not an abnormally small number. So this is definitely a point in Brady's favor over Russell. But if you look at titles, you know, Brady had seven titles in 20 years. I am including the recent data from Tampa. And that's in a 32 team league. So if you consider that each team has a one in 30 second chance of winning, the probability that you have at least seven titles is pretty small, but the probability of having at least 11 titles in 13 years is far, far smaller. So again, depending on the metric we use, one looks better than the other. Now, I know at least one person remarked on Moneyball a moment ago. I think I heard it from this part of the room. Did somebody say, did you say Moneyball? Oh, you said money, okay. How many people have, same concept. How many people have uh, read the book Moneyball? You know, I would also be open for you know, screening a movie of Moneyball at some point. Uh, fascinating application of applying math and stats to baseball. And so you know, trying to figure out you know, probabilities and whatnot. There are some great lines. You know, Billy Bean was the general manager of the Oakland A's and he used these math and stats ideas to help the Oakland A's with a salary of like one fourth to one third of the New York Yankees be one of the most competitive teams in baseball. But they didn't do well in the playoffs. And does anybody remember the famous line? I don't remember the exact line, but the idea was like it's too small of a sample space. So it's like anything could happen really. It's, it's, uh, so, so one is that it's, it's a small sample that you, you, when you have a long season of 162 games, luck is gonna average out. But in the playoffs, it's very short. And because of that, you could get lucky at the right time. And so there are entire research papers, you know, with titles such as, you know, why Billy Bean shit doesn't work in the playoffs. And you know, why the Oakland A's just haven't had that success, why they haven't won the final title. And so the question is, is title, are titles the right thing to look at? How much of titles come down to a little bit of luck? And, you know, if you look at the, you know, Patriots, you know, victory against the Rams a few years ago, the Rams should not even have been in that Super Bowl. Okay. So Brady played in games, Russell played in series. We need to take into account the fact that the structure of the postseason matters. And this matters in two ways. One is how many series you have to play and how long are they? So what I've plotted here is the probability that the stronger team wins any game. So what I'm going to do is the x-axis is the probability that I win an individual game. And the y-axis is the probability I win the series. Are you surprised that if my probability of winning 
a game is 50%, that it doesn't matter if I play a best of one, three, five, or seven, I win half the time. You, again, this is what we talked about last time. Look at extreme cases. If you win all the time, does it matter how many games there are in the series? No. So it makes sense that it should look something like this. And that as your probability goes up, you have a greater chance of winning. And that the longer the series is, does it make sense that the more likely it is that the better team wins? It's much harder to upset a strong team in a best of seven than it is to upset them in a best of one. Let's put it this way. If you win you know, 90% of your games and you play a best of seven, it's very hard for a team to pick up four wins against you. But if you play a best of one, what's the chance you lose? 10%, yeah, it's actually a very easy calculation. And so you need to somehow take into account the structure of the football playoffs is much different than the structure of basketball playoffs, you know, these seven game series. What, what I'm saying is we need, to, we need to calculate the exchange rate between a football Super Bowl championship and a basketball title is I don't think it's a one-to-one -one that the structure of the playoffs. And again, this is where we have to come up with statistics. This is one of the statistics that I was introducing is that you have to take into account the structure of the playoffs. That football, it is much harder to win a championship than it is in basketball. Okay, so I don't wanna go into too much of this, um, you know, just trying to look at how is Brady relative to the next couple of, you know, really strong people? How is Russell against the next, you know, really strong people? Just looking at what percent over the next one does Brady have in terms of titles, championship games, conference appearances, playoffs and whatnot. So I don't wanna go into that. I do wanna go a little bit into this, the log five method. And so this is a very simple version of a more involved model we're going to do later in the semester when we talk about baseball and trying to calculate the Pythagorean one loss formula, the expected winning percentage of a team. So we have two teams named boringly A and B. A wins P percent of their games and B wins Q percent of their games. And they face off. And we wanna know what is the probability that A beats B, okay? And so one of these formulas is correct and does a really good job. The other three are complete garbage. Does anybody have any idea how you might tell which one of these is reasonable? What could you do? Extreme. Good, let's use an extreme. So what's an extreme? A good, A's, A is unstoppable. And so if A, if, and what would you say for B? Okay, so, so if you take P to be one and Q to be zero, I think all of these give you one, right? Good, well, okay, so, so good. So what, well, before we do 0.5.5, let's do an average team. So let's say Q equals one half and let's take A to be one. Let's take P to be one. So A always wins and they play an average team. So what should the probability be? One. So if we look at this, if we put in one and one half and we start looking at these things, you know, we should be able to very quickly eliminate a bunch of these. I'm not gonna go through the algebra right now. I just wanna talk about what cases we would look at. So if we take P equals one and Q equals one half, good. What's another extreme case we could do? You mentioned a moment ago. One half, one half, or more generally. Yeah, if P equals Q, what should the answer be? Yeah, besides zero and one. So you don't have the matchup of the two unstoppables or the two Cleveland Browns, right? <laughs> or the older Cleveland Browns. Yes. Um, as an aside, does anybody know what the record is for most home losses? I'm sorry, most, oh, most losses on a road in a baseball season? Because we're picking on Cleveland right now. <laughs> it's not the Indians. Well, the Rockies might say so anybody have an upper bound for how many losses you can have in baseball on the road? 81. The Cleveland Spiders lost over 100 games on the road. The Cleveland Spiders were so bad in the late 1890s that teams refused to travel to Cleveland because they could not get enough people in the stands to make it worthwhile to travel to Cleveland. And so Cleveland was no longer allowed to play home games. It is a record that I think will never be beat. They were so bad 
that they could not play at home anymore. Right? So, so we could take P equals Q. And in that case, what should the answer be? 0. 0.5. And so we can look and see which of these reduce to one half when P equals Q. There's another nice test we could do. If P and is greater than Q, and they're both greater than a half, what can you tell me about the probability A, eats, a beats B? So against an average team, A wins P percent of the time. B is a better than average team, but not as good as A. What can you tell me about the probability? It should be less than P, but more than, more than a half. So by looking at extreme cases like this, we can actually analyze a lot of these. And so you know, we can go through, and I just enumerated a bunch of possibilities. And it turns out only one of these formulas passes all of these smell tests. No matter what you look at, eventually you will find ways to eliminate all but one. And the one that survives is P minus PQ over P plus Q minus two PQ. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is the need to look at algebra correctly. When you look at this, it doesn't really mean that much. But if we rewrite it, you look at the last line on the bottom, we rewrite it as P times one minus Q over P times one minus Q plus one minus P times Q. Here is a really simple model for a game. You either have a good day or a bad day, okay? If you have a good day and your opponent has a bad day, you win. If you have a bad day and they have a good day, you lose. If you both have good days or you both have bad days, we do it again. And so when we flow it like this, of the four possibilities, two of them terminate, and then the other two force us to repeat. This should remind you of something we did on the first day of class. Yeah, this is very similar to the hoops game with, you know, bird and magic, neither of whom made our list of, you know, greatest of all time. But this idea of just basically being able to reset. So we're looking at almost a conditional probability, you know, conditional on we terminate that we have good, bad or bad, good. Then the probability that A wins is it has to have a good day and a bad day. That's P times one minus two. And the probability that we have bad good or good bad is the sum of those two. And that's where it comes from. So there's actually a reasonable explanation for why this is a good predictor. And we can use this to adjust winning percentages. So if I have a team that wins 80% of their games playing a team that wins 75% you know, of their games, what is the probability that the 80% team wins? Because in the calculations we did earlier, I talked about if you win 90% of your games, well, 90% against who? You know, this year, if you're in the American League East, who would you like to play? Warriors, as much as possible. You know, you'll play them anywhere. You know, they, I think they were the first team, did they hit 100 losses first this year or was it the Rockies? Okay, they just got in the road. Okay. Um, I know the Oreos already have over 100 losses. And so, you want to be able to adjust your probability of winning based on who you're playing. Now, in some things like baseball, it's often going to depend who you have on the mound. You know, if you have your star pitcher, that's a very different than if you have one of your weaker pitchers. And so we can use this to adjust your probability of winning. So for instance, if you win 80% of your games and you play a team that wins 60% of their games, your adjusted winning percentage is you know, about 73%. So this is a really nice, simple adjustment. And you can actually check and see that this does a pretty good job when you feed in historical data. And again, which sports are going to be better for something like this? Well, okay, but sports with long seasons. Sports with long seasons. You know, football has you know, fewer than one tenth, you know, just barely, uh, fewer than one tenth the number of games of baseball, you know, 16 versus 162. Your basketball and hockey are in the 80s, so it's you know, much better than football, but nowhere near as good as baseball. But it's still you know, a sizable number. Football is very small, and especially if you've already clinched your playoff location, you may not be trying your hardest because you may be trying to prevent injury uh, right before the playoffs. So the last few games often are not important. So what we can do is we can try to adjust for a series versus um, a game. And so what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the adjustment 
that you win two series. And the first one on the bottom is a best of one. And the second one is a best of seven. And what I'm doing is I'm going to assume you're playing a team that wins 60% of the time. So not surprisingly, if you win 60% of your games and you're playing a team that wins 60% of their games, the adjustment is going to be you'll win half the time. It doesn't matter if it's a best of one or best of seven. If you win 100% of the times, I don't give a shit how many games we play, I'm going to win the series, right? The interesting part is what happens in between. And you can see there's a sizable difference. If I'm winning 80% of my games in a best of one versus a best of seven, that's a significant difference. And so what I did is I just calculated the ratio and we see that the you know, maximum ratio is maybe around maybe 1.6, 1.5, something like that. So there's a sizable difference between the two. What do you think is gonna happen if we look at a best of uh, seven versus best of one, but now for three series? Do you think it'll be more pronounced or less pronounced? More. And so if we now go up for uh, three series, you know, it's closer to almost a factor of two. It's, you know, more than 1.8 at the you know, maximum bump. So this is hopefully you know, convincing about just the structure of the playoffs impacting who gets the title at the end. That you know, the factor of luck is going to be far more prevalent in a best of one. Now, football is even worse. So what's the structure? Who can tell me the structure of the playoffs in basketball? There's uh, 16 teams based on each conference. Okay. Somewhere. Yep. Uh, they're seeded based on how long we have season. Yep. Once we close the season, last season to see. Um, and they play a maximum of seven games per round. First team to win four games in that series advances. Good. And so everybody plays. Yep. Now, the highest seeding you have, the better chance you have of winning because you're hopefully playing a weaker team. It's possible that that's not the case. Maybe a team is the eighth seed because they had a lot of injuries at the beginning of the year. The pay bill have all come back now and they're now prime. And there are times when teams deliberately lose games to get different seeding because we'd actually rather play this team. We stack up better against this team. In football, not everybody plays in the first round. There's 12 teams. There's six, there's six in each conference that make it. The top two seeds are exempted from the first round of playoffs. Well, given that you know it's one and done, being exempted from one round is tremendously important. So you know, if you happen to be in a weak division and you get to feast on your weak division and you can get one of those top two seeds, then you have a much better chance of making the playoffs. So when you're trying to calculate something like this, you know, I'm taking into account you know, playing three series, but you should also take into account um, you know, what is the strength of the teams you get to play? And if you're in a weak division, you know, six of your games are against teams in your division and you can just you know, run up the statistics that way. And so here we get a factor of about 1.9 as the most. So Bill Russell has 11 titles. I'm arguing maybe the NFL title could be equivalent to about 1.8 basketball titles. Does that seem plausible? It may not be right, but am I at least giving you a reasonable argument from reasonable principles that there should be some kind of factor taking into account that basketball and football may not be equivalent in terms of a title? Right, I mean, we have, we have the data from the season, but you know, again, uh, you know, pains me to say this as a Patriots fan, but the New York Giants stacked up beautifully against the Patriots. You know, their defense could put pressure on Brady with one fewer uh, personnel on the line than other teams, which meant that they could field um, a much more competitive defense and have more people downfield to stop the throws. So certain teams stack up better against others. So, you know, there's, there's no end of complications and stuff that you can do. The hope is just, you know, general broad brushstrokes. Should there be some kind of weighting that you're more likely not to get a title in football, not because you're not good enough, but just because in a one game series, you're more susceptible to luck? I, I agree with that entirely. I just, there's, there's other stuff too. I mean, one might argue uh, that it's hard to win basketball because you require constant effort, you know, you're doing more, I guess. 
So, so basketball, you have to win more games, but so does the other team. Yeah. And so the, so the question is, is the better team more likely to just keep winning in basketball because the structure is set up to reward excellence? Whereas football, the playoff system is structured more to, to give anybody a chance. You're more likely to have, I think, an upset in football than you are in basketball. And it would be very interesting to go through the data and see you know, how often do you get upsets in football versus basketball? And so if we use 1.8 as a conversion factor, then Brady's seven titles converts to 12.6, which does beat Russell. I'm sorry? No, he had more years, of course. And now you can start asking, you know, how do you take into account the longevity of a player? So Jim Rice, anybody know who Jim Rice is? So as a Red Sox fan, he was part of a beautiful tradition of great outfielders. You know, first it was Ted Williams, then um, Carl Yastrzemski, and then Jim Rice. And he eventually made the Hall of Fame, but he was in trouble for many years because he didn't have the great career stats. He had many years when he was one of the dominant hitters in the American League, but he didn't have the years of achievement. Because as he started going down, he just retired. He said, look, you know, I'm, I'm not at my prime anymore. You know, someone else, go. And so for a lot of these you know, sports, do you stick around and play, maybe not at the same level, but you're still above replacement? And how do you, you know, reward statistics for something like that? So there's you know, so many different complications you can put in over here. Uh, you know, this is just you know, trying to give you know, a, a, one possible approach to talking about you know, a real question, you know, Brady versus Russell, or more generally goat versus goat, or more generally boat versus boat, is if you're going to be using probability statistics, you want the problem to be extremely well specified. And then depending on what the problem is, you're gonna learn so many different techniques in this and other classes that you have lots of different analyses you can do. You wanna make sure you're doing the right analysis. You wanna clearly say, look, this is the analysis I've done. These are the assumptions I've done. I have learned firsthand that just because you put these are my assumptions does not mean people always read that you have listed these are your assumptions. But my assumptions here are the following. I am not saying who is the greatest player. I'm just trying to see which team is doing best with this person. And I'm not saying that the team's success is coming to because of Brady. So how much is due to Brady? How much is due to um, you know, Belichick? How much is due to some of the other players? It's really hard to answer questions like that. So if anybody is interested in pursuing any of these questions, you know, please email me. You don't really need to know that much you know, sports knowledge to investigate something like this. Uh, what we really need to do is we need to gather data. We need to come up with what do we think are the right metrics. I'm not gonna get into it right now, um, but I just wanna say for later in the semester, we might talk about you know, the concept of the mean, which we've seen before, but it turns out that there's more than just the arithmetic mean. There's more than just X plus Y over two. There's other means we could investigate that have other interesting properties. And depending on what statistic you choose, you can get very different answers. And that's what I want you to get out of today's class. You know, the amount of probability we needed to use is actually very minimal. This is not uncommon in the real world. You're not gonna use most of the advanced theorems you learn in this class. What you will use is the ability to set up a model to talk somebody through, here's the assumptions I'm making, here's the analysis I'm doing. All right, any last questions before we end class? I am going to just quickly stop.